All right, so uh, good morning. Um, I am uh, together with uh, Marie Ennis uh, O'Connor from uh, Ireland. Uh, Marie is a breast cancer survivor. Uh, she's uh, an e-patient, and she will talk a little bit about e-patients uh, in uh, our conversation. Um, and she's actually joining us from uh, Australia this uh, this morning in Europe and this afternoon in uh, uh, in Australia. Thank you so much, Mary, for uh, for accepting the invitation to to have a, a short conversation with us. Hi, Harris. It's good to talk to you. Um, yes, I'm I'm talking to you from down under, from Australia, where it's evening time and it's. 45 degrees Celsius today, so it's very, very, very hot, and that's been really quite a <laughs> quite an adjustment. But all is good, all is good. As you said, I'm from Ireland, and I'm here in a research sabbatical. I'm at Flinders Medical School. There is a cancer um, research centre, and I'm doing some um, collaborative work there with some research with some researchers on the experience of cancer survivorship. So it's it's a very exciting time for me, and. Um, and I guess you can say you said I was a breast cancer survivor, and I, I wear many hats. I'm a breast cancer survivor, which is how I got very interested in the e-patient movement. I didn't even know I was an e-patient, and apparently I was. I didn't know there was a movement for what I was instinctively doing, which is find, trying to find the best care for me. And um, so it's led me to research e-patienthood and to become a patient advocate. Um, I'm also very involved in, in social media. I'm a social media trainer. Um, I'm a healthcare writer and blogger. And um, I find that social media has been a wonderful way to bring all the different parts of me together and to really, um, to really make uh, not just a career but a life for myself. So I think it's a very exciting time to be in healthcare. I think the opportunities are, are very exciting and, um, and I look forward to talking to you in, in the next few minutes about this. Oh wow, that's, uh, that sounds really amazing. And I can see that you're wearing multiple hats and you're having multiple I, interviews. Yeah. I am. I even have my sun hat here <laughs> for the weather. <laughs> But metaphorically speaking, I'm wearing a lot of hats, yes. But I think the wonderful thing about, um, about with technology now and with social media is that we can bring a lot of the different um, parts of ourselves or also globally we can collaborate and, and it's a way to integrate a lot of different um, movements and a lot of different ideas. So I think that's a wonderful thing about social media. Yes, yes, I can agree with you about that. Uh, would you like to, to share a little bit of your of your story as a patient, how all this began? Yes, I'd be happy to. As I said, I didn't know that I was an e-patient. Maybe perhaps I should just um, back up a little bit and explain a little bit more about what an e-patient is. So it's a term that we're becoming more and more familiar with. And I think a lot of people think that the E in e-patient is just electronic. So there's somebody who are very maybe email savvy or internet savvy. But really, it's so much more than that. And the simplest way to describe it comes from the e-patient comes from a 2007 paper by Dr. Tom Ferguson which uh, described the e-patient as someone who is enabled and is equipped and empowered by the new technologies of the internet and of social media to really take part in their own health care. So it's about a patient moving from the passenger seat into the driver's seat. So they want to drive their own health care. Now we're not saying that they're doing this on their own and very much this is a collaborative, a participatory movement. It's about working with the health care provider. Um, so it, it's also in terms of this new healthcare paradigm, which is that in the past, perhaps the patient was more passive, um, they would not have been maybe as well informed, the doctor would have been the one who would have had the information. But now the patient has more access to information, and research has shown that um, some of the patients actually, about their own condition, may even be better informed than a primary care physician, let's say, because they have done so much research. So um, that's a little bit of background about what a knee patient is. I was diagnosed with breast cancer in 2004, and my journey to e-patienthood began as most of us probably do start out on this journey by googling the symptoms diagnosis, what is breast cancer, what have I got, um, what are kind of treatment options do I have. But I was very much at a, at a beginning stage. It was just 
just researching the symptoms. This was before I think social media really took off in 2004, which I can't believe is nearly 10 years ago now. Um, but in the last five years, maybe five to seven years, there's been an explosion in social media. So I was just before that explosion and I, I was quite limited in the information or quite limited in what I could do. But nevertheless, I used um, the internet um, for research purposes. But when I finished my treatment, I found myself in this very strange limbo land, which a lot of survivors find themselves in. So what it meant was that um, after cancer treatment finishes, you can be left feeling very um, confused by your emotions. So a lot of survivors will say that they, they feel um, lonely, they feel un misunderstood, they feel um, depressed, and they feel isolated. So for me, when I was looking for more resources and more support, I couldn't find it at that stage. This was 2008, a couple of years after I'd finished treatment, but I was still feeling kind of pretty bad. So I started my own blog, which is Journeying Beyond Breast Cancer, and that was a way for me to reach out to others. It was a way for me to have my story validated. So my, my interest in social media really took off with that. And then I discovered Twitter, and I discovered tweet chats, which is actually how I met you um, yes. through a tweet chat. So I discovered this whole new world of, of um, information being shared, um, not just, I mean globally. So I can remember that I was in Ireland, you were in Italy, and we met in a, in a chat, a Twitter healthcare chat in Australia. I still find that incredible. I find it incredible that we can break down those barriers, not just of healthcare patient provider status, but of information, of global, of geographical, of time. So um, that that's really where I got very, very interested in the potential for social media to transform healthcare. So you can say that actually um, the social media and, and internet uh, really helped you uh, beyond uh, this um, um, uh, your, your, your disease, uh, the cancer. I mean, it, it was the moment when you uh, survived and you realized that you were some, somehow isolated or um, you were confused with your emotions, right? So yes. that's very interesting because most of the people perhaps believe that um, any patient can be uh, the one who is dealing with the problem uh, at that moment, at the moment of the presentation of the, pro of the problem. Uh, but it's so interesting to, to hear this perspective uh, of a person who used uh, these uh, means of communication to actually uh, continue this, uh, this uh, journey beyond the disease. Yes, and I think you bring up an important point, Harris, which is that um, we're quite, just saying patient conjures up an image of somebody who's ill, who's in hospital or who's recovering at home, um, but what we mean by e-patient is far, far broader. So I still call myself an e-patient because I'm still learning about the disease that although I'm in remission and I'm doing really, really well, something like cancer is a chronic disease. I'm always going to live under the shadow of cancer. Um, I think social media, we really, really see it in action with chronic diseases. So I'm sure you're aware that the diabetes community are very, very active on social media. Um, cancer patients extremely active, and also rare diseases, which we don't know, we don't perhaps hear enough about, but their communities are very, very strong within social media. So. I still call myself a patient. I'm still educating myself about my disease. I'm learning. I'm still learning how to live well, um, how to live healthily, and also I think a really, a really important part of the e-patient movement is that you'll find that the e-patients really want to make things better for the patients that come behind us. So we want to use what we have learned, not just in terms of of how to manage our disease, but how to live after the disease has the symptoms have abated or we're moving on with our life we really want to use that knowledge and to share that knowledge with those that are coming up behind because it's a steep learning curve I have had a conversation yesterday with a group of cancer survivors here in Australia and they had some of them were just starting treatments and were just finished and I just thought gosh I wish I knew now what I knew I wish I knew then what I know now because I feel I know so much now that would have been so useful to me then 
So it's part of that is that we want to use what we know now to try to make that journey a bit easier and to try to, to um, minimize that learning, steep, steep learning curve for patients when they're just starting out on their journey. I think that's a very, um, it's something that you will see in e-patients a lot, um, that we don't, we don't move beyond, we don't, we don't put our disease behind us. We see what can we, what have we learned and how can we use that to help others. Yeah, that's not, that's really really fascinating. Um, it's it's uh, yeah it's uh, uh, this peer community that is uh, is creating uh, is being created is is, is is really amazing. And as you said, it's uh, also fascinating how you can uh, really influence the life of a, of another person that is uh, from a totally different geographical part of the world, and uh, you can find so uh, many common things, common emotions viewpoints, uh, experiences to share with people uh, from, uh, from um, Australia or Canada or, or uh, South America. That's, yeah, that's something really amazing. And also that it's, that it's universal, so it's not just, in the beginning I was very enmeshed in the whole cancer and cancer survivorship movement, but in the last, I would say, year, I've become far more aware of the universality of our experience. So it doesn't just have to be about cancer. In fact, it just it can be about it, it can be about mental health as well. It can be about depression. It can be about um, um, how do, how do we live well, not just physically, but how do we live well mentally, and how do we look after our health holistically? So I'm becoming more and more interested in that. And again, I see huge potential for social media to support us, not just physically in our health, but also mentally and psychologically and socially. Can I ask you something else? Um, do you believe that this is a movement? This movement is for real, uh, or is it like another, yet another internet bubble that is going to burst and disappear? And I know you know what my answer is. This is, this yeah, is but going I, to be a very I'm good question. No, I'm glad you. Yes, no, I, I know you know what my answer is going to be, but I'm really glad that you asked the question because I think it's a very valid question and I, I know that many people do do have that impression that perhaps social media is just about tweeting what you had for breakfast or, you know, what the latest celebrity is up to. So I think that if a person asks that question, perhaps they are viewing healthcare through an old paradigm so they're through, viewing it through the lens of what I spoke about earlier which is where we had this um, doctor-patient relationship where the doctor was the one with the knowledge and the experience and the patient was the one who was receiving the doctor's knowledge but I think we've seen a democratization of, of um, information and medical information and again I stress I'm not saying that the patient knows more than the doctor but the patient is now becoming an expert in their own disease and that's not that's not going to change what is going to change and what we will see changes are in the social media tools and the platforms we use so I can't say that Facebook in fact it's looking very much like Facebook will not be <laughs> will not be the great giant that it is in the next year it, it's it's looking like it's maybe losing its foothold in there so I can't say that we're going to be doing this through Facebook or through Twitter but I can definitely say that we've started a movement we've started something that has, is not we can't turn back the time on it so what I see is I don't see that we're going to talk about e-patients we're going to talk about patients who are empowered, engaged, enabled by information, by technology, that's not going to change. In fact, the e-patient will be the patient of the future, will be the norm. So it's here to stay, it's not a passing fad, it is not going away. We, ha we, are, we are empowered by knowledge and you can't close, once you've opened that box and once you've opened that door, you can't shut it again. But as I said, how we do this, the technology and the tools will change and will evolve. But no, we're not. This is not a passing fact. <laughs> do you think that there is any danger that may prevent this uh, vision of the future? I'm sorry, I actually missed that question there, Harris. Yeah, do do I, it's that, a, that there is any danger that may prevent, or any barrier that may prevent uh, this yes. uh, from happening? Ah, yeah, I see what you mean. I think that the future is very, very exciting. I'm very excited about it, but I am also very concerned about some things that I do see. I see um, 
a digital divide. So we're, we're talking about people that um, don't have access to the internet maybe or to the devices that we're, we're getting more used to, the smartphone or the iPad or just as I said, the internet. And traditionally we're seeing this as maybe an older population or um, socially disadvantaged. Now I actually see that gap is closing. So I don't, th I think that that is an issue, but I think that's an issue that we can overcome easier than the issue that I'm most concerned about, which is what's called e-health literacy. So even though somebody has access to the internet or has access to, to this information, do they know what to do with this information? Um, do they know how to interpret it? Is it actually written in a language that a patient can understand? Um, so we need to do an awful lot more work about how do we find the right information and how do we monitor and measure the quality of that information. So I think that's going to become um, that is already a big issue and that's something that we need to work collaboratively with. So there is user generated information being generated by patients. Some of it is absolutely amazing, it's wonderful, wonderful stuff, but some of it isn't. So we need healthcare providers to work with patients to make sure that the information that gets out there is authentic, is reliable and is, um, is evidence based. So that would probably be my biggest concern. Um, other than that, I suppose I do have some slight concerns about maybe um, healthcare providers not being fully on board with the uh, enabled, um, empowered patient. But, um, I guess but, I do, but I do see that changing. I do yeah, see exactly. that changing more. And exactly. um, so I'm, I'm not particularly concerned about it. My big concern would be the digital divide for sure. Um, and also I think that we're not... Um, I, I think that a lot of the information we're producing, we're not producing enough information that's multicultural and that's necessarily taking a cult, so it's it's almost a one-size-fits-all information mm. that we're producing. So we need to maybe look a little bit more around that. Um, but definitely, our, it's more exciting. It's definitely exciting. And the other thing I see in the future is I see that we're going to move towards um, more. Uh, what's called just-in-time health information systems. So we're not necessarily going to Google our symptoms, but we're going to. The information is actually going to come to us. And I know that some companies are already starting with this. I, I was reading about an initiative where um, big data and supercomputers, and and we can use the information that that generates to proactively send out information to people, let's say, that are about to enter a depressive episode. Um, and I speak quite a bit about um, mental health because this is actually quite a, um, a very this is a very interesting area to see how social media is being utilised. Now, the other concern that I would have, of course, is privacy and security concerns. Um, I think we're still at a stage where we're flying ahead with gathering data, but not necessarily putting the stops in place that will protect the patient. So I think we need to do some work around uh, now. I'm not around making patients more aware of what's happening with their data. Um, but again, I, I absolutely see all of these, um, these hurdles as being surmountable and I see a very exciting future for us in healthcare. Yeah, it, it looks really, really exciting. Um, let me ask you a very uh, a last question here because uh, this is a, such a vast topic and I'm quite sure that we could uh, talk for, uh, for hours about that. Um, but I, I just wanted to ask you one last question to, uh, in order to conclude our conversation. We've been talking about patients. What about caregivers? How do you see them in this picture? How can we uh, be influenced by uh, the means and the uh, tools uh, of the internet era? Again, it, it goes back to what we were saying was that, um, or perhaps I didn't say it earlier, I, was, I meant to say it, um, when we say e-patient, we don't just mean the patient, we also mean those that love them and care for them. So everything I've been saying about how the internet and social media empowers patients is absolutely applicable to caregivers. And um, on a practical level, caregivers can um, can research the information that they need to find out about um, the person that they're caring for, about their disease, and this is particularly important when the, the, per, the patient that they're looking after can't actually, um, doesn't have the energy or doesn't have the interest or, or just is physically not able to look up the information, so the caregiver takes that, takes that role on. So 
on a practical level, it's exactly the same, the same way to, to research the information. On a psychosocial level, we know that um, it can be a very isolating and very lonely experience for caregivers. So again, we see the internet and social media as um, a cyber shoulder to cry on. So the person can find uh, support, they can find um, information on, on different aspects of caregiving from people that understand what they're going through. So for me, when we say caregiver, it's the same thing as, as e-patient, as patient. It's the same, um, it's the same experience. So Marie, thank you very much uh, for uh, joining uh, this uh, conversation. Would you like to add anything, any other comment? I'd just like to say thank you as well for giving me the opportunity to speak about this. It's something I feel very passionate about. Um, I know you asked the question about was it going to go away and I know you don't believe it is either, but I think it's a very important question and um, I hope that the message that I can give today is that um, it is something that's very important not just to patients but it's also very important to how healthcare is going to work in the future because if you have patients that are um, educated about their disease, that are well informed, that understand their disease, you're actually going to have better outcomes and research shows this as well, that we're going to have better outcomes and um, it's going to be better for healthcare in general. So um, in the words of a very famous e-patient, e-patient Dave, Dave de Broncard, I will leave you with one thought which is let patients help. Oh yes, that's a very, very important message to that. Thank you very much for sharing this message with us. It is, uh, I think it, it is the best message to close this uh, very, very beautiful conversation that we've had. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Harris. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you.